Ben, looks like uh, after accomplishing success with our technical difficulties, we are ready to go. So um, well, I'd like to go ahead and call the April 28, 2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Could we please start with a roll call, please? You bet, Mayor Brian Bagley. Here. Council members Christensen. Did we lose Paula here? Oh, okay. <laughs> Council member Hidalgo Faring. Here. Council member Martin. Here. Council member Peck. Here. Council member Rodriguez. Here. Council member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Let's go ahead and say the pledge. No flag, so just imagine it in your heads. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, just a quick reminder, any, anyone wishing to speak during first call public invited to be heard um, or on a public hearing item, that's item seven and item nine, we'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting. Instructions for how to call in to provide comment will be given at that time. Comments are limited to three minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. So moving on to item three, approval of minutes on uh, for April 14th, 2020 regular session. Do I have a motion? I move approval. I'll second that. Second. All right, great. It's been moved by council member Waters, seconded by council member Peck. Uh, any further dialogue, debate or changes to suggest? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All aye. All opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, anybody have uh, uh, agenda revisions or submission of documents? Let's go with uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, so you can give me some guidance. You tell me how you want this handled. I have two questions that I think would be most efficiently handled in this phase of the meeting, but um, but I wouldn't frame them as direction to staff, or I can frame them direction to, as that direction to staff and have them come back next time. Well, let's just go ahead and say it. All right, well, I just want yeah, to make certain. Yeah, I'm right. gonna say it. Here are the two questions. One is, uh, uh, there's activity with and around the Stamp Well, um, north of, of Union Reservoir. Uh, I had a chance to visit with Dale earlier today about that activity. And uh, I, I, I asked Dale several questions. I got good answers from Dale, but I do think the questions and the answers are, are worthy of uh, those who are watching this meeting, both hearing the questions and the answers. And if there are follow-up questions from the public, a uh, chance to know what they're following up on. Now, I could, you know, I could bring that back, but I, I think it'll be a better use of Dale's time if we just deal with it. And if that's the case, um, the, the, here are the questions. What's the status of this, of the, of the, uh, stamp well, uh, it was to be put with our agreement. Uh, we were going to plug, it was going to be plugged. Uh, it was going to be plugged. I think it, to coincide with the production of the night. Well, that was the, the contingency for it severing that flow line. All that got done last spring. Uh, but there's now activity with the, the, the stamp well is apparently pumping oil. Uh, it's being pumped into a tank. Um, so it'd be helpful to know how, why is that, number one. Number two, how long will that continue? And uh, associated with that pumping, there's been some methane gas released or flared. Um, and my question are, are, what are the risks, health risks associated with whatever that release or flaring has been? Is Dale here? Like, uh um, Mayor Bagley and Councilman Waters, I can respond to that quickly. A um, couple of things. Um, Councilmember Waters is correct. The, the stamp well was shut in, is, is the terminology that's used. Uh, last, um, around last June, May or June of uh, last year. At that time, the, uh, the gathering line, which was a, a line that passed through the eastern part of uh, the city of Longmont, was uh, decommissioned and taken out of operation. It was, it was effectively, effectively cut off and abandoned so that uh, we did not any longer have that gathering line going through neighborhoods uh, in East Longmont. That being said, 
the stand well is not plugged and abandoned as of yet. Uh, it is in that shut-in state. And what that means is that it is still a, uh, a, a well that can operate technically. It is being held in that shut-in state so as to hold the, um, the leases for all of the mineral rights underneath that well that are uh, owned by top operating. And in that shut-in state, uh, the well does continue to produce a small amount of oil, um, something on the magnitude of a, a couple of barrels, um, up to maybe 20 barrels a, a month. Uh, the tank that is out on the site is about a 300 gallon tank. And, and so it's a small amount of oil that is being produced, again, because the, the well is not abandoned yet. Um, it also uh, will produce a small amount of natural gas that will come up the, the borehole. And that is uh, burned on site uh, with a uh, emissions control device that is authorized through the COGCC and is uh, done in accordance with the state procedures. That all being said, <clears throat> the well will stay in that condition it, or is intended to stay in that condition until such time as the uh, Cub Creek um, uh, begins uh, production of wells from the night site, which is another consolidated oil and gas site uh, north of Union Reservoir uh, that was included in the agreement uh, between the city and top operating and Cub Creek um, uh, last year. And so um, that is what I believe is the activity um, that Councilman Waters is, is referring to. Dale, Dale can you uh, comment? I asked you earlier today, well, and I understand you're not, a, you're not the scientist on this and you're not, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to set you up to be the analyst uh, with the final word on this, but I did ask you earlier today, and I think it's, I think it's a, a question that others will be interested in, interested in, and that is what are the risks associated with either the flare or the burn uh, uh, of, the, of the methane that is associated with that, with the oil? Uh, you're correct, Councilman Waters. I am not a scientist on, on those matters, but uh, it, it is generally my understanding that, um, again, it is uh, being uh, controlled in accordance with COGCC uh, procedures and, and, and um, practices. Uh, that being said, um, I, I would I would um, I would I, I would suggest that it, it, in the absence of being in very close proximity to the well, you're not going to experience um, uh, an impact from it. Um, it is nonetheless one of literally thousands of wells in that uh, area of our state in Well County and. Uh, Certainly, whenever it does um, uh, have a a, a, a um, burning of that uh, propane, <clears throat> excuse me, of that methane, you know, there are some emissions, obviously, that will come from that. Um, I I have also been told by top operating that they did a a forward looking infrared uh, camera test of the well not long ago, and there were no um, leaks or emissions coming from the wellhead. So. Um, to the best of my knowledge today, I don't believe there is any ongoing leakage at the well, uh, nor do I believe it is being uh, operated in any way that's inconsistent with the state standards or the state uh, regulations for oil and gas wells. And all of that is consistent with our agreement? Yes. And. Dale, just the, the other, the related question to this was: For how long do, do, is it? Is it a unknown uh, time frame? It's like contingent then upon the night site. Correct. It, it's a it's sort of a performance type of time frame. Uh, the performance or the action that needs to occur is the um, completion and production of a well at the night site. Um, given today's uh, situation with oil and gas and, and the, uh, the markets. Um, I don't believe it's known when the wells, they were originally intended to be drilled here. Um, I have not talked with uh, Cub Creek to see 
if their plans have changed, I can do that and uh, certainly report back to council on that information. I have one uh, unrelated to that, Mayor Bagley. I have a second question, but others may, I'll be quiet here. Others may want to. Just get it out of the way. Go ahead. Well, the, the second question really has nothing to do with oil. It has to do with masks. We get, uh, we are, we receive uh, emails from time to time from residents uh, wondering why we haven't been more uh, assertive in or directive uh, to residents that requiring that people wear masks if they're outside or in grocery stores or in proximity to other people. Um, and I, I labor under the perception that there are some issues that over which we do not have authority or some options that people might uh, uh, exercise, even with the governor's uh, order. So I don't know if this is a Eugene question, but I, I, I am curious, what are the limits of our authority to direct people to wear masks and under what circumstances? So before, hold on one second. So what, Harold, can you answer that? And then Joan, I think you had a motion coming forward. And so this has been the topic behind the scenes. Harold, could you talk about, answer Dr. Waters' question, and then also talk about what the, the what the county health directors are gonna be doing? So I'm gonna give you a high level um, answer to the question and Eugene can go into details, but we've been looking at that related to um, there were some conversations on cities um, talking about creating an order for masking. Um, Eugene has looked into that and we would have to um, go through our emergency order process as outlined by the charter, which actually at the end of the time period only uh, reduces it by five days in terms of implementation. Um, today, um, this afternoon, I was on a call with the county health department and then some of you all saw the update that they were going to provide. Um, at this point, um, various county health departments are in the process of um, putting together some guidance and, and it look, looks like an order in, term, in terms of the requiring masks to be worn. And we were told that we should see that information by Wednesday or no, no later than Friday. So it appears that the health departments are gonna be taking that action. Up until this point, um, it has really been a suggestion by the state. And so we'll know more between Wednesday and Friday in terms of what they're going to do. And that just came out this afternoon before we went on the, the meeting. Thank you. All right, anything else? That's it, right? Hold on one second. Uh, Joan, you were, I see you, Marsha. I see you, but it's Joan's turn. Uh, Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Actually, this is a continuation of that uh, topic. Um, I think that I, I was called by um, the mayor of Louisville, and I, I think uh, Mayor Bagley, you were as well. And um, several cities are thinking about and are willing, cities in Boulder County, of doing a temporary ordinance as a mandate for wearing masks inside of businesses or at drive ups in grocery stores. And uh, regardless, it doesn't have to be a mask, it can be a bandana, it can be a t shirt, it can be something that covers your mouth and uh, nose. Um, one of the reasons I am for this is because of the cities and the counties, basically, to the east, south, to the east of us. Um, Northeast that are uh, not adhering to any of the governor's uh, rules and regulations and suggestions. So um, as they come into our city, as we start relaxing our businesses, our restaurants um, and other, uh, other facilities like massage parlors, et cetera, um, if they are not used to wearing masks and in their city or their county, they are not told to do that, they will not come into our city expecting that. So uh, the example was given to me was no, sh no shirt, no shoes, no service. It'd be no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Um, so uh, what I would like to uh, move then is that we, based upon what the public health department comes out with on Wednesday, you said, or Thursday, that um, if they do not come out with a policy, I would like to move that the city have a temporary ordinance requiring everyone doing business inside a business at a drive up window, anything where there is 
contact that is not recreational be uh, mandated to wear a uh, nose and mouth covering of some sort, preferably a mask. So um, that is my motion based upon uh, the public health department's uh, decision and what they come with up with. Because if we wait for another week to do this, then the next uh, regular session, it'll be two weeks. So is the motion, is the motion specifically, and it hasn't been seconded yet, but I just want to clarify, is the motion you're making about the people who run the business and work at the business wearing masks or about well, requiring And people? whoever goes into the business. For example, um, I've gone to, uh, as, as most of us have, to take out, to drive up windows, both for coffee or whatever, and nobody, no one there was wearing masks. And I actually had to tell some people, you need to be wearing a mask. If you're touching my food, if you're talking to me, if you, so it's for people working in the business as well as those going inside or to the business. So the, 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 the but the motion is dependent upon what the uh, public health safety, Boulder County uh, and the other counties come up with. If they make it a mandatory suggestion, not a man, a mandate, then we wouldn't have to have an ordinance because it would be a mandate right. um, by public health. But I personally don't want to wait another two weeks for a regular session to do this because things move too fast. So do you want me to repeat my motion? Well, I, I, I think we got it. Okay. Councilmember Martin. Well, I would second it if it's a valid motion to make um, because I've been hearing the same things and giving the same advice uh, and seeing the same things. Um, I would need an explanation of what kind of a procedure this actually is. Um, the other thing I want to get clear, well, two things I want to get clarified is that the, the governor's orders do mandate that people working in essential businesses wear masks. So those people are in violation um, and unfortunately the governor has not um, been willing to say anything about what the consequences of a violation really are supposed to be but when it's somebody handling our food I agree with council member Peck it, you know there should be there should be enough consequences that that proprietors will pay attention to it um, and a apparently the public feels the same way. The other thing is, uh, for most of the public, I, I was watching the uh, Boulder County Health announcement this afternoon on Facebook Live, and they lost their feed five times, and it seems like they timed it precisely for um, whenever anything important was going to be said. So even <laughs> <laughs> even when, uh, even by going back and, and looking at the fragments that were posted on Facebook, you still couldn't tell what happened. Could we, if, if anybody heard it in a continuous stream, can they please give us a recap of what the main points were? It cut out for, I think, everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Okay. So I nobody knows. So, all that, so I'm going to, I'm going to, so the motion has not had a second. Yes, I seconded it, but I wanted, I asked for an explanation of how it would be done because I don't understand right. I, the I, I parlamentary the, details you can, you of can it. Either, you can either second it or not second it, but, but well, no conditional I seconded seconding it. it. Okay, well, I'm I'm not good. Well, good. I, just, I just wanted to explain because I don't know how it works. Right. I won't withdraw the second. I just Perfect. want to understand. All right. All right. So the, uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring, did you raise your hand? Okay. Anybody else have something up there? Uh, Councilmember Peck? Um, so to address that, uh, Councilwoman um, Martin, I don't have those answers nor the details. And I would think that would be something that our uh, uh, city attorney and his staff would have to look at. Um, and it would probably be just like, um, from, what, from my understanding, after talking to a couple of other mayors uh, that are interested in doing this, the understanding would be the proprietor of the business would could refuse service just like they do with no shirt, no shoes, no service. And that's, 
and and I don't know, I am not going to discuss the legalities of that or anything because I don't know. And that would have to be something that staff would bring back to us. That's not my question. My question is how we can make a motion for a temporary ordinance. I've never heard of such a thing and I don't know how that parliamentary well, procedure would, would work. And oh, oh. We could just have it expire on a date certain, yeah. Marcia. Right. But okay. the, so that, so, so first of all, let's, let's, so first of all, this right here, um, just to be clear, we're not voting on a motion to do anything. We're voting on a motion during this time to bring it back to discuss and then have a first ordinance and a second ordinance. That's and not so, what Joan said. That's why but, I required an explanation. No, no, so, so right now, so right now our, our rules are such that, that we don't take most, these motions are to put um, uh, motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas, not to make, make motions and debate the issue, if that makes sense. So when, Harold, when do you think this could be on the agenda? So what we would have to do, and this is uh, the conversation that Eugene and I, we, we literally talked about it, I think, yesterday or this morning, and then we heard what the county was going to do, which made it easier, actually, if, okay. it, if they do it. Okay. Um, and, and so what we would do is, we, um, I think they have something drafted or a skeleton drafted, because we were anticipating this type of question. Okay. We would, we would have to change the fifth to a regular session and then have the first reading there. Then we would have to have the second reading and then by charter. And here's where it, every city gets is different in this. Um, by charter, we then, instead of the 10 day ratification period, it's five day ratification period from the second, from the second reading. And, and so that's when we were starting to do the math um, it starts taking that out over time, which was then today in that conversation when we heard that um, the county, the health directors were looking at placing that order. Um, and it appears very likely that they're going to do that. And that's going to come out in the next, within this week. Um, we realized, well, that helps us a little bit. But your motion is, if they don't do it, then we would bring it back. Exactly. Tuesday and start that process. And then if council does pass this motion, then I will communicate into that group to say the council is supportive of this um, because they were also looking for that feedback as well. And, Perfect. Right, so, so before I count on Mayor Pro Tem, I'm not gonna call a point of order, but, but we, there, there is a, we've already voted on something similar. And that is Polly, uh, made a motion a few weeks back about who we were going to follow. We talked about following Boulder County, the Boulder County Health Department, the governor, the CDC. Um, uh, Susie. Was it Susie? Yes. Anyway, somebody Susie. made a motion and it was awesome. And we yes. all voted and we said, we're going to follow the experts. And so, uh, and so uh, uh, I'm not going to call point of order and, and make a big deal out of it. It's just my concern is, Again, I've, I've sat on these calls and listened to Mayor Hancock, Colorado's only strong mayor, um, you know, kind of get into a political, uh, uh, don't want to say any, use an inappropriate term, but, but he argues with uh, Governor Polis about well, who can put the most restrictions on, on the state versus Denver. And um, I continue to be a big believer that we should follow the governor. And, uh, and uh, that's what we voted on. Um, and in the event that there's a contradiction, what there's not here, we should follow the county. So I'm not here. I guess I'm, I, I had a conversation with Mayor, the, the mayor of Louisville as well, Joan. And uh, she told me she'd be calling all you guys to kind of lobby. And I mean, anybody can call you guys to lobby. My only concern is that, again, we're not experts. We're not medical doctors. Uh, I prefer we leave it up to the county and just follow, follow their, their guidance. Because right now I saw a meme online that said 40% want to stay in their homes thinking they're going to die. 40% think this is a hoax. And 20% think this is 5G cell phone towers. Um, uh, some plot to overcome the... Anyway, it's supposed to be funny. But my point is that um, I'd rather... I'd rather... I personally would rather just follow the health department. If they don't think it's important enough to implement a, a requirement that we have masks, um, then I would ask, why would we think it's important enough to have masks? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I was also going to uh, 
speak briefly on consistency as far as not creating a bunch of patchwork uh, policies in the jurisdiction of the county. And then also I'd just be very interested in the actual specifics of the policy. Uh, I know that's not within the, what this vote is, but uh, the, the specifics of the policy considering, you know, folks that for maybe medical reasons cannot wear a mask, how enforcement works, uh, age, uh, age borders as far as two and under, six and under, and how those are already working, for instance, with Walmart, uh, already enacting a policy on their own as far as not allowing folks into the store without masks on. And I believe theirs is a two and under policy as far as children are concerned from what I was seeing. So I, I just want to make sure that if we do this, and I'm really hoping it, it's much more efficient, obviously, if it comes from the county level, uh, it'll take effect much more quickly than if we go through the whole ordinance process. But um, I would just hope that we can find some sort of consistency also there as far as what the, the policy ramifications would be of said man. So that, that's just my concern, but I will be supporting adding this to the agenda should the county not make a move. Thank you. Yes. All right, anybody else before we vote? And again, this is just to add it to the agenda. Yes. All, all right. Councilmember Martin? Uh, yeah, I would just like to add that from what one could tell from the Boulder County Department of Health, uh, the question was asked whether they would be doing it, and they said they'd be supportive of doing it. I'm not sure what that means, but I would also like to add that um, Longmont has the highest number of cases uh, per unit of population of anybody in Boulder County at the moment. So I think we should take action if they don't. Harold, have we, I mean, other states have been, have we heard anything about testing for antibodies? I mean, like New York, 21% of New York City have it, 13.9% of the state. Do we, have, is anybody testing in Colorado to see actual infection rate? No, we don't have the tests. Right. I know that. Okay, Councilmember Martin. May I answer the question? I had an antibody test yesterday and got the results back today. And where would so, you go down? Yeah, right. But but are we doing? But are we doing sample sets? I know it's available down at Denver Jewish. But is anybody in the government actually taking action to find out? It's 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 available at most clinics in Longmont now. I went up to Quest Diagnostics on, on North Holber. You, did you get it? Um, so you, yeah, I haven't had it. You haven't had it. Okay. Yeah. Well, home then. So, so the answer to that question is there, there's limited antibody testing right now, and you're seeing it at different locations. I think they're waiting for a more robust um, group to come in, and, and as they indicated today in some of the calls, they, they I think they, they feel that'll happen in a few weeks, and Dan yeah. can clarify that. Um, I think the challenge right now with that is is really understanding the efficacy of the specific antibody test mm -hmm. and the error rate in it, because each one has a different component to it. So, um, but they are working on getting that um, right now. They're primarily focused and we'll go over some of this in the update. Right. But so, it's so coming. As we vote, I mean, for example, the question I'd have is what about, I mean, if, 20, if 10 to 20% of Colorado have already had it and therefore they've, they've, they've got the antibodies, are we going to require them to wear a mask too? So, and then how do you tell? So uh, Susie, do you want, do you have something to say or do you just like your pin? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Peck, did you have something to say? No. Councilmember Martin? Yeah, I happen to know the answer to that too, um, which is that it has not been established whether having antibodies confirms immunity or not, confers immunity or not. Right. Um, but uh, the Abbott test has uh, a 100% sensitivity and a 99.6% uh, sensitivity. No, let's see. Anyway, <laughs> the important metric whose name has escaped me, um, the Abbott test is, is uh, incredibly effective. Some of the others are not and have error bars around 15%, but if you make sure you know which one you're getting, you can get a really good test right now. All right, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, all in favor of putting this on the agenda for the next meeting, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. Vote passes six to one with me against.
but anyway, let's go ahead and- Mayor, Eugene May here. Could yeah. I just ask for clarification? So I know what, yeah. what, what you guys are directing. Putting, so I- in the event that the motion was, I'm sorry, the motion was that you, uh, we are, we are the next agenda meeting. We'll be discussing um, putting a a, uh, a directing staff to put together an ordinance to be heard on the first reading that would require all businesses that are open and all people frequent going in and, and using those businesses to wear masks. In the event that the Boulder County Health Director does not require it first. So I have an ordinance drafted that would add to the city manager's emergency authorities explicit authorization to require members of the public to wear masks or personal protective equipment. I'm thinking we should okay. just go ahead and put that on the next agenda. Right. Okay. So not an ordinance requiring it, but a authority of the city manager during a declared state of disaster yeah, or I think, emergency. I, I think that works. And I also think my fellow city council members would like that put on the council yes. agenda as soon as possible. So let's just go ahead and put it on the, the first reading of an ordinance next, next regular session, change the next study session. So it's a regular session. Council member Christensen. Uh, I think that's a very good idea because it would, um, uh, giving that authority to the city manager who deals with operations will make would make it a faster, more efficient um, thing. I mean, we can direct them to do that, but he can also just do that uh, by himself as part of the authority, <clears throat> the emergency authority. So I'm on. I'm in favor of that. All right. So y'all good, Eugene. I got all I need, Mayor. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, let's move on to uh, city manager report on the COVID-19 update and emergency items. Yeah, so um, I'll go ahead and, and start off with um, a high level, high level overview and then ask Dan to go over some data. Uh, one, of the info, one of the pieces that I was gonna cover is actually the information that we got received today from the county about possibly um, making the requirement of a mask uh, implementing that at, at a broader regional level. As I indicated earlier, um, the, the big component of that is, um, or the timing of that would be sometime between Wednesday and Friday of this week, based on what was communicated this afternoon. Um, as you all know, um, there is a, a state right now where some, some counties have chosen to take the, the governor's um, directive and have begun the loosening of those requirements. Um, obviously Boulder County, which was part of a group of counties, extended it to May 8th. Um, and there was a lot of confusion regarding what the, what the governor meant when he talked about the release and what it meant in terms of timing on this issue. And, and so um, I have um, just received this evening a document that I'm going to try to call this up really quickly, a document that, that really goes through and starts parsing the differences of what the governor said and what um, the Boulder County ordinance really means. And, and then talk a little bit about what they talked about during their, their webcast that may or may not have been cut out and, and why they did certain things. So generally on the 27th, um, what happened was that the governor's order allowed uh, for um, trying to, the governor's order allowed for um, non-essential businesses to begin curbside sales um, via that order. It did not allow those non-essential businesses to open up. The Boulder County order essentially replicates that that non-essential businesses can begin um, curbside um, sales. Um, there, there's some questions that we're trying to resolve on the real estate side. We've had some questions from realtors. Um, the Boulder County order says um, real estate showings for unoccupied homes only can resume at this point. Um, and if there's questions on that, what we're doing is asking everyone to go into the call-in number that, that exists for Boulder County Health so they can give specific um, answers to questions. Um, and staff on site are to continue minimum basic operations. 
um, under the governor's order on May 1st, um, under the safer at home component, retail and personal services can open if they're implementing best practices. And so if you've seen some of the press conferences from the governor, they're starting to lay those details out. Uh, we're assuming again that tomorrow uh, during the press conference, there will be more details to that. We'll have that information. Um, under the county's order, they're still with curbside pickup for non-critical retailers and the real estate stays the same and we're still under the same provision of the stay at home order. Um, and then on May 4th, um, under the governor's order, operating under safer at home, the offices can reopen at 50% reduced capacity, again, if best practices are being implemented. And so when we look at the, the Boulder County order and the orders that exist in some of the other counties, there is a seven day difference between um, retail and when that can open for customers to come in. Um, actually seven to eight days difference between what the governor's order is and the Boulder County's order in terms of retail. And then the other businesses um, operating at the 50% capacity, there is a five day difference in from the fourth to the ninth when that would be reduced or the eighth, depending on when that, that comes off. So it's a seven day or a four day difference. Um, again, there's going to be more specific guidance coming out both from the state and from the, the county health departments in terms of what that needs to look like and how people need to operate. So what the county's saying is on May 9th, all businesses operating under safer at home, retail and personal services can open if implementing best practices, office can open at 50% reduced capacity. If best practices are being implemented, businesses should still use telecommuting to the greatest extent possible. On May 9th, these two orders now come in together where essentially what the county's saying is what the governor's saying and things are in alignment. Today during the conversation and what was put in the document, um, and I don't wanna put words in Jeff's mouth, but what he did say is barring a significant change in the number of cases or hospitalization, specifically if hospitals are getting closer to the red line, this will be implemented on May 9th. And so they're watching the data to guide their decisions in terms of how they move through that process. And so um, data is gonna to continue to be a big piece of, of what we're talking about. Um, when, when we talk about just the amount of confusion in this, when, when the 27th came out, we know that we had people prior to hearing what Boulder County was going to do, thought they could open their businesses on the 28th. The reality was that never was allowed under the governor's order, but we didn't have those specifics in, in terms of being able to, to, to give definitive answers. And so as we start moving in this period of relaxation, and this was a part of the conversation that we had on, on an administrator call, is really keeping those uh, phone um, banks in play to answer specific questions. When we look at just what we're trying to do now, I mean, there is an understanding of the orders. Um, and to give you a sense, the most recent order that came from the state was um, over 35 pages. Um, there's obviously questions every time these orders are, in, are issued in terms of what does it mean related to these specific activities and how do we enforce it? And so we go through that process. And so if council will remember um, what we're really hearing, what, what we went through as we were stepping into this, where we were seeing orders going, we need to close this or we need to close this. And we were then trying to figure out what did that mean? We were literally going through the same kind of scenario as these orders are coming forward in terms of relaxing it. Um, and talking to um, the Boulder County Health Group in conversations that I've had with them, and what they talked about on, on their um, Facebook Live item is there were a couple of things they were trying to do. One, I think because of the uncertainty in terms of what those specific requirements were going to be, what they indicated is that they really needed time in order to put those in place. And they're going to try to get those out as soon as possible this week so that businesses actually have a chance to understand what they have to do. 
because that was a lot of questions that we were having coming in is what do I need to do in order to open? Frankly, we were asking the same questions as we were trying to look at our facilities because we didn't know the answer to a lot of those things. And, and so that is a that was a big piece for a lot of these folks is to really get the rules in place so they could do that. The second piece, and we touched on it, which was really testing and making sure that the testing capacity was there um, in, in their Facebook Live and in, in some of the briefings that I've had today, they are seeing that testing component moving along. And, and so I think um, in terms of the number of tests that they can do per day, you know, that's a big component that they're looking at. Jeff did also talk about the fact that they are getting um, a lot of these supply chains are now starting to come back online. So they're getting more certainty in terms of having the materials they need to perform those tests. And so that was a component of, of needing more time. Um, the other component that, that Jeff mentioned in, in his conversation, um, multiple conversations today is it also times into when the, the surge capacity at St. Anthony's Hospital will be ready. So right now, what you have in Colorado is you have surge capacity, I, I believe, being built in Pueblo. You have the convention center in Denver. You have the ranch in Loveland. And then they're also looking at St. Anthony's in terms of surge capacity. And they're predicting that all of those things will be um, online about May 15th. And if you, and, and Dan will go over some of the numbers, but to, just to touch on a couple of things, when we actually look at the numbers for Longmont um, and, and what they're seeing is a, a big part of those numbers are actually related to our senior care facilities um, in terms of the individuals that live there, the staff that works there. And, and so that's part of the surge. And, and if you weren't able to really catch that, what, what Jeff was talking about is that when those individuals tend to become hospitalized, they become hospitalized for a long period of time. And so part of the conversations that we're having in this process um, and that Karen's been working on and others when they talk about surge capacity is a level four facility. And a level four facility is really a place where people don't need the intense care that they normally would, um, but they can't go back to where they were living. And so the level four facility then allows them to transfer individuals to these locations so they, they can keep the capacity available for those that need that higher, that more intensive treatment in there. So those are all the things that were in play when they were looking at mm -hmm. the time lane and what, the timeline and what they're trying to do. So, um, you know, barring some of those, the, the two significant shifts, they said they are committed to, to moving forward on the ninth based on what they're seeing at this point. And so, you know, we daily have see a dashboard in terms of where the hospitals are and what they're trying to do. Um, and what I will tell you all and tell the community in this update, um, every, when we have our CAN reports and we hear from the hospitals, we're also hearing what the capacity is. We also hear the, case, the cases that we're running from our fire and paramedic system. And, and so we know what's happened. And, and, and based on the most recent update, um, there is, um, Ample, I wouldn't say it. there's a lot of capacity in the hospitals, at least my last update. Dan may have to correct me on that based on if he's heard something new. Um, one of the things when they talk about masking and many of the questions that you asked is actually um, what um, these county health directors are looking at in terms of what do we require? What can we enforce? How does all of that come together? Because what we're finding in many of these cases is the people that we have to actually get into enforcement combined with the enforcement that they have to do, um, we're doing a lot of triage. And so for example, instead of pushing some of the enforcement on some of the business calls that we've been receiving, going to the police department, we're actually utilizing code enforcement to do the first run at and, and have the conversation with them and then communicate to the uh, county health department um, and only then, if it, if it starts escalating, do we bring it in because it's also managing a broader capacity uh, of the overall system as we try to move forward with this. Um, at that point, I will stop and answer any questions and then I'll go to one more point and turn it over to Dan. All right. 
by Councilmember Christensen. You need to unmute, Polly. You're muting. Sorry, Harold, has there been any discussion uh, about Weld County's, you know, Weld County has four times the number of people uh, affected as we do. And they're six miles to the east of us. And is Boulder County discussing that at all and whether there can be any kind of an understanding between, between the counties so that we don't get heavily impacted uh, by, uh, right. by their poor practices? <laughs> I want to I want to share you I want to share a screen with you all okay. real quick. Um, so there's there's a lot of conversation and so if you look at um, Weld County um, and I went into their website um, and, and you look at their caseload and, and what they're really seeing. So um, I will start with this blue area here, which is essentially Greeley and Evans. Um, and you look at their case count, that's about 1,242. Um, when you look at the northeast corner, uh, it's about 116. Southeast corner, about 165. And then if you can um, look in this area where you have Milliken, Johnstown, um, Firestone and Frederick, and then you start moving closer to county line one, they have about 100 cases. Um, so the bulk of the cases in Weld County um, are, are actually occurring in this area around Greeley. Harold, yeah. we're not seeing your screen. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. I can figure it out. So it's, you're saying it's more concentrated in select areas. Correct. Yeah. Right um, Especially yeah. the meatpacking plant and um, uh, okay. old age facilities. Can you see the screen now? No, but that's it. All right. <laughs> Harold, you may note too that the city of Greeley is not following Weld County's direction and is in fact following Governor Polis. Greeley came out right. a couple days right. ago. Yeah. And, and obviously that Greeley and Evans is really the area where they have the, the bulk of the cases when you look at the numbers. Um, and, you know, in terms of that interaction, you know, the governor was pretty pointed in terms of um, how they're going to approach areas that don't follow the state guidance on this. And um, um, specifically, um, there is funding tied to it um, that they talked about. And, I think on uh, Monday, it specifically mentioned um, a lot of the grants that we get for our emergency management system. And, and so they are holding funding if people don't, don't follow the guidance on that. Um, but we are talking about that. Um, it is a topic of conversation. Malcolm and from Erie, we both have this conversation because we're there. But again, most of the caseload is really in the Greeley-Evans area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, why don't we go ahead and move on to Dan. Uh, I've got one more update before we go okay. to Dan. Um, one of the things we're going to be talking to you all um, about budget issues uh, next week and, and what we just wanted to say today is um, the, the how we evaluate our revenue is, is really going to be a um, monthly exercise for us. Um, and we'll know better when the month is closed out and we balance it next week. But at this point, it appears like March sales and use tax will exceed our projections um, for March. Um, what I will say is there is no guarantee that that's going to continue for us. Um, we saw really strong returns from our big box groceries, discount stores, as well as internet sales. Um, at this point, we're gonna to continue to proceed in terms of what we described to you all with our budgetary controls and sales. Um, and we, we really think, and, and we're trying to look at a, a lot of, we're trying to really work through this, but we think March may have been an anomaly just because of the boost in sales with that initial rush to the stores. So really getting through April is going to be 
um, really every month between now and the end of the year is going to be incredibly important to us to watch what we're really going through um, because we just have to see what's happening. Um, we have some other theories that we will either have more certainty or less certainty once we see the April numbers, which won't occur until, you know, in May. And so we're gonna be lagging some of that data and trying to, to see that. The one thing that we did say is, you know, any stronger results here on the front end um, could be needed to offset some of the impacts of the businesses that have been, have been impacted today uh, for longer than our than we projected in the two months, or greater than a five percent recession for the rest of 2020 and what we're seeing in 21. And so I know we talked to you all during the last budget process about a recession. Um, we're obviously thinking the same thing based on what you know we're seeing in terms of the data. So um, wanted to let you know you 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 will see. Um, projections with very strong, a number that exceeded our projections with strong returns. That's a one month look and we're going to have to be taking those one month looks as we're moving through the process. All right, uh, now should we move on to Dan? Yep. All right. Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, I think Harold did a pretty good job on the update. I'll just give you a few details here on some numbers. Um, uh, like Harold mentioned, you know, they're really looking at, at May 8th to really come in line with the safer at home order, you know, barring a large scale surge. They're really looking at, I think, four real main points. The first one is making sure we can maintain the social distancing concept. They're really estimating that we're at kind of the 60 to 65 percent social distancing number now and um, really making sure that we don't go below that. The increase in testing would be the second component. And they want to get to the point where they can test 500 per day. And we're at about 150 now. We're getting a lot more help from the state on testing kits and capacity. They're setting up a kind of a pilot community testing site at Clinica in Lafayette. And we're hoping to get one um, up and going at Salud. They're working with places like UC Health and Centura to really increase their capacity too. So I think that's kind of good news on how we can increase the, the testing capacity and broaden it out to the community. But what, what goes with that is as we increase the testing capacity, obviously the amount of positive tests are gonna go up. So with that, we have to have the ability to do what's called contact tracing. Uh, and it's public health essentially contacts all the positive tests and understands where they've been. You know, Who have you contacted? Where have you been? And they do a little bit of detective work and contact all of the people that they have come in contact with so they can um, ask for self-quarantine, those kinds of things to make sure that we're getting to that test and isolate that um, really is gonna help contain, contain the spread. And then the last piece would be the, what Harold mentioned on the businesses have clear guidance on what they really need to do to comply. And that's really gonna come in the next day or week or so. Uh, the biggest concern by far right now in the county is the long-term care facilities. And the reason that is, is they, the highest rate of, of hospitalizations come out of long-term care facilities. And when those hospitalizations come from there, they're typically far more serious and they lead to things like higher ventilation, ventilation usage and longer stays. So a, a case coming out of a long-term care facility is normally more serious. So they're really trying to make sure that they're focusing a lot on the long-term care facilities. Um, the, the hospitals have really through this whole thing stayed under capacity, at capacity, under capacity. There's no hospital in the state that's needed to resort to crisis standards of care. And then there's one kind of um, little data thing that, that I wanted to, to go over with you. And I don't know if we successfully shared a screen or not, but I'm gonna give it one more try to see if we can do it here. Um, I'm gonna try this one. Did that work? It did? Oh, look at that. So this guy right here. So this is the website that shows the Boulder County positive tests. So you'll see this big spike right here on that's 423. And if you look at the state data, it's exactly the same. There's a big four day spike of data that 
it's all kind of going along like this and all of a sudden there's a great big spike. So we talked to Jeff about that today and what that is, is they caught up on a backlog of cases that just needed to be entered. So it wasn't as though there's this big gigantic um, kind of outbreak that day, it was just sort of a data anomaly. And it's also worth mentioning that these case numbers are what's called a lagging indicator. You know, when, when somebody contracts the virus, they're um, you know, asymptomatic for a little while, and that's usually the time where they're the most contagious. So then they start exhibiting symptoms, then you go to your doctor um, after a couple of days, then it may take a day or two to get into your doctor, and then it, uh, you get a test, and then it's another couple of days before you get the results. So that's, that could be seven, eight days before the number actually hits here. So that's why a lot of the times you hear public health saying they wanna see an extended time frame of cases either leveling off or going down because it is such a lagging indicator. Um, let's see, I think I just had a couple more things I wanted to go over here. Um, just on the general um, OEM side, we're gonna be moving to really support recovery next week and kind of moving into normal operations with severe weather and flood season coming. Um, PPE supply chains are starting to become more robust and normalized. And there was kind of a little bit of a discussion about antibody testing. And I certainly am no scientist in this, in this area either, but I think there's one important distinction that, that should be made is antibody testing is not, a, is not to be used for whether or not you currently have the virus. That's not something it's used for. And then on the other side, it can detect if, it's helpful in trying to detect if you've had the virus, but really it's not a 100% effective measurement either because this is a novel virus. It can detect if there's antibodies in your system, but it's not a proof positive that you cannot get the disease again. You know, they're telling us that they don't know that for sure, but it is, it would be nice to have that robust, robust testing capacity for the community too, but we're not quite there yet either. That's all I've got for you this evening, unless there's questions from anybody. All right, no, thank you very much, Dan. We appreciate your work, keep it up. All right, let's move on to the consent agenda. And Okay, Harold. Couple of points that they wanted, couple of points that they wanted me to reiterate um, for you, not so much for you all, but for the community. Um, the big thing for us as individuals, um, as we move into this next stage, social distancing, ensuring that we're doing that and, and then masking. Um, and I know that the masking piece is confusing because when we started out, they said, well, that could be worse because you fidget and you put your hands near here. What they're really starting to find is that it, it doesn't keep you from getting it, but it keeps you from potentially infecting someone else because it reduces the, the way it spreads when you talk. And so those are two pieces that's gonna be really important for us as a community and as individuals in the community to really embrace as they're evaluating how we continue to move forward in this process, which is why I think they're talking about it at the county health director level in terms of these requirements. The second thing, and Dan touched on this, and today was a good example. Um, for those of you all that didn't see Dale's email, we, um, we had a fire it happened to be next to a transformer. Um, and so they had to de-energize some lines for the firefighters so they could actually do their function. But there are other things that are continuing to happen. Um, and right now, um, as Dan mentioned, we're getting into runoff season. Um, and so we're gonna have folks monitoring that and evaluating that situation. But then in the, in the conversation with the county as a whole, they're also in fire season. Um, and, and so they are also trying to look at their system as well because there's a potential where some of these other things can happen in the middle of this and you're ma now managing multiple pieces. So just for council, you know, there are other issues that we now have to monitor in, in light of all of this. Um, and we had a, a small taste of it because it was next to one of our transformers, but in the ever, you know, the fire department, police, LPC did a great job but those things are still gonna happen as we're continuing to move forward. And those are just ongoing challenges that are just on top of this. That's all I need to say. All right, great, thanks Harold. 
All right, let's go ahead now and move on to consent agenda and introduction and reading by title of first reading of ordinances. Don, can you do that for us, please? Uh, Mayor Beck, I think we have first oh. call. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry, thank you. you. You're yeah. right. So let's go ahead and move on to first call public invited to be heard. Um, so if we could go ahead and uh, put up the, the information. So the public is invited to dial 1-669-900-6833. And when prompted, enter the meeting ID, which is 833-0860-6089. And we'll wait about 60 seconds to allow people to get into the uh, meeting queue. Mayor, yeah. if I might, we did receive two uh, email comments from people. So while we're let's, waiting, we didn't let's see go let's read. Let's read those. And by the time we're done, that'll be about six minutes. And if nobody's <laughs> in, we'll go on. So go ahead. Sounds good. All right. The first one is from uh, Allie Finnegan. And her address is 1837 Spruce Avenue. Uh, and she says, the pandemic crisis has given me the opportunity to observe closely some topics that I otherwise may not have focused upon. Studies show a correlation between poor air quality and susceptibility to the virus. In December, the EPA required the state to reduce the ongoing severe air pollution along the Front Range. After the school district closed in-person classes, traffic on Sunset Street dropped to a proverbial trickle. Sunset carries traffic for five schools. Thousands of individual vehicles cause bumper to bumper tra weekday traffic. Why? The coronavirus has negatively impacted a disproportionate number of Hispanic residents. City of Longmont job postings prefer or require Spanish speaking applicants. We have developed a culture wherein Spanish speakers are not encouraged to speak English. I view this practice as a disservice, a practice that has marginalized thousands. Now those residents have become a danger to themselves and to the public at large. It is time that this paternalistic attitude be revised to welcoming others and orienting them to the civic responsibilities of re residing here. Mayor Bagley um, through his, was, has lost respect and support. His juvenile rant during the council meeting with Boulder County Public Health revealed alarming ignorance. A public official following an inappropriate public outburst generally immediately issues an unequivocal public apology. Bagley's guest opinion at the Times call is not an apology. He needs to resign. Comments published from the last city council meeting included Bagley stating he will be transparent about the negative impacts the pandemic has had on the economy. Television networks, radio stations, print media, and the internet continually carry this information. Bagley's transparency adds nothing. Other council members offered no planning, reassur reassurance, or action regarding the pandemic. The crisis requires local leadership, determined in individuals with vision, Leaders who put the well being of Longmont residents above hand wringing and inertia. Now, public health officials warn that after warning, warming over the summer months, the virus will reemerge. Whether virus is a wave or a surge will depend on our efforts over the next month. We need an inf infrastructure to manage the pandemic locally. What sort of infrastructure? A diverse group of dedicated resident ambassadors to facilitate downsizing of city staff salaries and a reworking staff roles to support Spanish speakers learning and in English, the pandemic and civic protocols, to install an emergency warning system to replace the one we previously relied upon, to organize a call line for residents, to regularly host informational seminars using safe protocols, to assist businesses re with reopening, to secure a facility for those afflicted with COVID, um, and to coalesce away from their families, to liaise with public health officials. Now's the time to mobilize in defense of our public health. Masks, hand washing, and social distancing have mitigated the spread, but only cohesive, consistent efforts will keep us safe until a vaccine is developed. Once public health rebounds, the, rebounds, the economy will follow. Phew, one more. This one is from Daniel R. Pavon, General Counsel and Chief Government Affairs Officer for Medicine Man Technologies. And he states, I am writing in support of agenda item 9B, allowing cannabis companies in Longmont to access new forms of capital, including those from publicly traded companies. As you are aware, last year, the legislature passed House Bill 191090 that allows investment in cannabis business, businesses from out-of-state sources and redefined who is considered an owner. This change is not only timely, but pertinent, pertinent to our changing economy. Cannabis companies do not qualify for the federal assistance other companies in Longmont can rely on. Without access to, tradi to traditional banking services, including short-term personal or other business loans, investors are critical to keeping our businesses open. This was true when legislation passed and is even more important now. As one of the four licensees in Longmont, we ask you for your support of this change in the ordinance and look forward to remaining 
part of the fabric of the community. And that's all I have, Mayor. You're muted, Mayor Bagley. Dawn? We hear you. Okay, so is there anybody else in the queue? Did they call in? We have three people, Mayor. All right, let's go ahead and hear them. Caller that uh, has a telephone number that ends in 470. I'm gonna unmute you. When you are unmuted, could you please state your name, your address, and you will have three minutes. Business loans, investors are critical to keeping our businesses open. Hello. This was true when legislation passed and is even more important now. Hello. As one of the four licensees in Longmont, we ask you for your support of this change in the ordinance and look forward to remaining. So it appears that uh, she's listening to the feed and she can't hear or he can't hear us. I'm going to try caller uh, that has a phone number that ends in 119. I'm going to unmute you. If you are listening to the live feed and you can hear me, please mute your television or other device so that we can hear you on the phone. So caller that has a phone number that ends in 119, I'm gonna unmute you. Please, hello. Hi, hi, hi. this is uh, Karen Dyke. I'm at 708 Hayden Court. I want to, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, I want to chime in on the remarks by council member Waters early in the meeting. I'm very concerned to find out that the stamp well continues to operate. And because the pipeline is plugged, they are flaring all of the substances that are present, present after the oil is separated off. This includes methane, propane, ethane, and various VOCs. And that would include things like uh, benzene and toluene, which aren't good for us to breathe. Now that we are aware of this flaring, the high amounts of air pollutants found at the Air Union Reservoir monitoring station make more sense. As Boulder County Commissioner Elise Jones of State Senator Fenberg wrote in an op-ed in the camera today, this is a quote, clean air seems more precious than ever these days. Not only is the world reeling from a respiratory virus pandemic, Research shows that inflicts more harms in communities already suffering from polluted air. Along with our ever-growing traffic levels, the extraction and burning of oil and gas in our region is a leading cause of lung burning ozone, earning us an F grade from the American Lung Association. Jones and, and that's the end of that quote. Jones and Fenberg were writing to support the esteemed air researcher, science, research scientist Detlef Helnick who was abruptly, abruptly terminated at CU over his work with Longmont and Broomfield. Helmick is, is um, also suddenly facing extreme scrutiny from the Daily Camera. In March, a very positive article about his work was written by a reporter. This month, they pulled this story and quoted COGCC and COGA, saying that the stamp well was plugged and abandoned and that the reporter was inaccurate. We now know that the stamp well isn't plugged, isn't abandoned, and it's likely the source of the burst of methane Helming described in the pulled article. So a reporter was fired, Helming was fired, and an associate of Helming was also fired. Three good guys all terminated. Someone with a lot of money and power must be extremely interested in shutting down our air monitoring here. I beg you to stay strong as a council and to continue this valuable monitoring. And I would just like to say to um, Dale that um, the oil and gas amount is uh, reported monthly to COGCC and you can find it if you dig hard enough through their pages. They burned off um, the last reporting that they've done was in January, but they have reported every um, month. They burned off 14,000 cubic feet of gas in January. We also know that there was a workover rig at that site at the end of March, which means they're probably stimulating it or some problem or issue was at that well. This well has a history of bad compliance if you look through the uh, COGCC website. Thank you very much. Thank, that's three, thanks, good timing. Next. 
All right. We're going to speak with caller that has a phone number and it ends in 470. I'm going to unmute you. Mel is uh, reported Hello? monthly to COGCC and you can find Hello? it if you stick hard enough through their pages. Hello? They burned off. She's listening to the broadcast again. Uh, yes. Let's try the other guest. I'm going to unmute you. This is for the caller that ends in 633. Hello? Can you hear us? You're online. Uh, hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Marianne. Hi, oh, Marianne. Yeah. I just have something brief to say. It's not going to be a long, you okay. know, Okay. Before you minutes. begin, that's fine. Before you begin, can Thank we you. ask you to please state your name and your address? Uh-huh. Marianne Rigai. I've been to meetings before. <laughs> um, 70 21st Avenue, uh, Colorado. I mean, Longmont, Colorado. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you thank that? you. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just am concerned. Am I on now? Yes, you are. Okay. I'm concerned about senior residences, especially those which are um, uh, independent living, because um, uh, in, in the general public, for instance, um, we are to wear masks according to the governor's strong suggestions. I don't think it's an order, but he's encouraging us please to wear masks in public so that if we're near someone, I believe this is why, if we're, if we're close to someone, we could sneeze or cough on that person. And if we um, have, a, um, have the virus and don't have symptoms, or even if we do, uh, we could uh, transfer the virus to that person. So I think that's the reason, the, the the strong reason why we're to wear masks in public. So in senior residences, there are public areas. And I don't think, possibly people don't think about this. There are public areas, including the lobby and the hallways. So when one needs to pass other residences anytime, day or night, in those public areas, um, one can get closer than one is supposed to accidentally or because there's not as much room in a hallway and possibly transfer the virus if one has it and doesn't have symptoms or if one does have it um, by sneezing, coughing, or even breathing on or toward that person. So that's why I think it's important in senior residences to know that there are public areas within the building. Thanks for listening. That's all I have to say. Please make a note of that and be aware of that, please. And if signs can be put up to remind people that they should be wearing masks, it's real important that they do. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Bye. Marianne. All right. <laughs> all right. Is that last person back with us? I will try one more time, Mayor. Great. Hello, caller that ends in 470. Are you there? I I think I am. Am I? I'm here. Am I there? Yes, we hear you. Could you please begin by stating your name and your address for us? Very good. Sure. Michael Belmont at 841 Tenacity Drive. So thank you and greetings, uh, remote council members, and very much appreciate your continuing good and earnest work during these challenging times. And um, I was just actually going to pose some questions uh, also about the stamp well and some of the surrounding recent um, events and readings and so on. Uh, but a lot of those questions I think were answered and I appreciate uh, council member Waters for his questions and then Dale for the good answers that he provided. Uh, but the, I, I would echo uh, Karen Dyke's comments and observations, in particular that in mid-March, um, the very professional and first-rate air monitoring that was uh, f through uh, for that was provided uh, through Detlev Helmug at the time at CU was registering extremely and unusually high levels of methane in mid-March, which was peculiar, uh, seemed peculiar at the time. And then, of course, as Karen pointed out, a, a resident apparently was at Union Reservoir, uh, 
recreating socially distanced, I believe, uh, and noticed a, a rig at the stamp well and, and photographed the, the same, uh, which of course raised questions. The, the city was called and they assured that the stamp well was shut in, which obviously now is, it must be differentiated from uh, capped. Uh, so apparently there was, quote, a workover <laughs> rig, which I still am unclear about what that means. Was that actually continued or additional fracking or refracking? Uh, of course, this flow line that was closed uh, running to and from that well uh, was sealed and cleared. So no methane is being uh, produced other than the little bit was noted for flaring. But um, obviously there's some, some oil as well, but uh, I guess I share the concerns that uh, the great effort that the council made and the, the agreement per, with Cub Creek uh, protecting the city was wonderful. It's just that uh, this whole incident and the, the uh, upsurge in at the worst time, of course, it could be in this uh, uh, methane readings were um, Unusual, and I and finally, I just want to say too that I was ex extremely alarmed by the the sudden firing of Detlid Helmug, who uh, with CU, who has a long history of stellar research as an atmospheric scientist, many many years, in fact decades, uh, as well as the journalist who reported on the high readings. So that's right. it. I just uh, right. could just th th thanks, Michael. That's three. Appreciate it. Very good. Thanks, Mayor. All bye right. bye. Okay. All right, that concludes our public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead. Can we get the screen back, Mayor, please? We, yep. We have one more. Do you want to let yep, them yep, in? Or? Yeah, sure. Let's go ahead. Oh, no. I think that was uh, the last gentleman that I put right. back into the waiting. We're okay. good. Cool. I mean, could I get the, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, could you go ahead and read our consent agenda, Don? Third time's the charm. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Item 8A is Ordinance 2020-22, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of seven utility access and storm drainage easements within the West Grange Filing 2 subdivision, generally located south of Nelson Road and east of 75th Street, public hearing and second reading scheduled for May 12, 2020. Item 8B is approved one capital improvement program amendment for the 2020 to 2024 CIP. All right, do we have a motion for the consent agenda? Councilor Christensen? No moved. I'll second that. All right, seeing no further discussion, all in favor of passage of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, consent agenda, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Let's move on to item nine, ordinances on second reading. Just before we go through this, for any public wishing to speak on any of the three items on public hearing, uh, go ahead and please call in now. Um, once again, the number is 1-669-900-6833. Um, you can leave that on while we do this. And so uh, when we're ready to hear public comments on each item, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the callers to hit star nine on their phones. That allows uh, Ms. Wolick to, to see that you've raised your hand to speak on that item. And then we will call on you based on the last three digits of your phone number, just like we did in public invited to be heard. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record and will be allowed three minutes. So first, 9A, Ordinance 2020-19, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Bram Municipal Airport, Airport Hangar Parcel SH6T to Western Airport Development, LLC. Are there any questions from council? I can, um, can we, can we go ahead and push back? Let's take that number off now. Perfect. Um, are there any questions from council? Councilmember Peck? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just actually have a couple of clarifications. Um, in the executive summary, it says that um, this hangar will be used for private aircraft storage. But my concern is when we go down to the goals and goal B1 says that this lease allows for access to high quality public transportation. So I'm a little bit confused. If this hangar is only gonna be for aircraft storage, are we in sense, my concern is about um, charter aircrafts. Uh, since this lease allows for access 
to high quality public transportation, what does that mean? Exactly, because this is a private airplane. So why is it public transportation? Um, I'm uh, texting David right now. I, I think we left him off. Joni, are you ready? Can you get this one? I can. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Joni Marsh, uh, City Manager's Office. So, Joan, I see that the Council goal added to the comm here that you just read out. Um, right. I, I'm not sure that that is the most appropriate goal that would have been placed on the Council comm in regards to the transportation high quality public transportation. This is really additional private hangar development at the airport strictly. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, and it, it um, I understand that B1 was a diverse housing stock with higher densities, access to high quality public transportation, food and jobs, but then it is restated that it is about uh, high quality public transportation. And I just wanna make sure that as we move forward, um, expanding this airport, et cetera, that when we have these statements, that it isn't a segue into um, charter planes or uh, passenger aircraft without coming back to us. So I just wanted to make that statement. And uh, with that, uh, I will move item 9A. All right, anybody else want to make a comment? Councilmember Christensen? Molly, yeah, there you go. No, just to second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-19. Uh, Don, do we have anybody? Mayor, this is Susan. It doesn't appear that anyone has called in for this item. All right, um, then let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, it's been moved and seconded. So let's go ahead and vote. All in favor for ordinance 2020-19, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-19 passes unanimously. Ordinance 2020-21, the Bilford Ordinance amending chapter 6.70 of the Long Island Municipal Code on marijuana sales. Um, are there any questions or comments from council? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-21. Uh, uh, Susan, is there anybody in the queue? No, Mayor, no one has called in. Do you want me to display the number again? Uh, no, we, we've, uh, yeah, I mean, you can, but, uh, but we've already, I mean, they should have called in the beginning. So that was the instruction. So um, on the next sugar mill annexation, if anybody's listening, um, we're going to go ahead and display the next, let's go ahead and display the number. We'll wait 60 seconds. And uh, on all items for second reading, you need to call in now and get in the queue. So Mayor, it'll take about a minute before it shows up publicly because there's a delay on our stream. Let's, so let's, you know. let's take a two minute yep. break then, if that's okay. Anybody, is that okay for everybody? Grab some water. All right. Me. All right, let's take two minutes. We didn't vote on marijuana, did we? Not yet. Okay, we're just taking a mid break. Allow call anytime. Yes. I see.
All right, can we get the uh, number off the screen and go back to the full view, please? Perfect. All right. We, we we have, have a, go ahead. We, did have, we do have a caller. Perfect. Let's go ahead and uh, Councilmember Martin. Uh, we didn't vote on the previous ordinance, did we? No, no, we're, we're get, the, 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 we have to open it up for public hearing. Uh, we passed, okay, we, never pa mind. We, we, we're, we're, uh, we did vote and it passed unanimously for the airport hangar, item A. And now we're on to a bill for an ordinance amending six, chapter 6.70 of the Walmart Municipal Code of Marijuana uh, stores. Okay, and so, uh, sorry. Yep, so we're gonna go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-21 and ask callers wishing to speak on this item to go ahead and hit star nine. So can we bring him in? Yes, Mayor. Caller that uh, your phone number ends in 054, I'm gonna unmute you, please. Uh, go ahead and state your name and your address. Oh, hi, this is Kristen Thompson with The Green Solution in Denver. Um, I just wanted to be available for questions. Um, I think you have heard from us in the past and heard from my colleague, Mr. Pabone with, um, with Medicine Man and just wanted to be available for questions, that's all. Okay, great. Well, does anyone have any questions? And if no questions, does somebody wanna make a motion? I'll go ahead and move. I'll go ahead and move ordinance 2020-21. I'll second it. Second. All right. That was seconded by Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. Um, seeing that nobody has any other questions or comments, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of ordinance 2020-21, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right. Ordinance 2020-20. Ordinance 2020-21 passes unanimously. Thank you very much for joining us. All right, let's move on to item C, sugar mill annexation. Uh, first of all, sugar mill annexation update and revised annexation agreement. Harold, do you have a report? I think Ava's online for the report. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Hi, Ava. Good evening, Ava Pehajewski, Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is a, an annexation over in the southeast area of the city. Uh, I do have a, a short, brief PowerPoint presentation, which Susan will pull up right now and share on the screen. One minute. Okay. Uh, good evening. So, uh, yeah, okay. So we're going to just uh, give you some background on this uh, with the property location. Uh, again, this property is southeast uh, quadrant of town. It's uh, south of Highway 119 and east of 3rd Avenue in what's known as the Mill Village neighborhood. It is west of County Line Road. You can see it there on your map. I'm sorry, but um, because she, uh, Susan's sharing the screen, I don't think my mouse will work. So, uh, I'll just try and describe it for you. Um, oh, you can go back. Oh, thank you. Uh, and so this property is the one with the star there. It's about 17.44 uh, acres. Uh, it's undeveloped. As you can see south of the property, we have a city of Longmont Greenway. Uh, and then we have the St. Rain Creek south of that. Um, the property to the west is um, in Boulder County and it's zone general industrial. Uh, and then the river bend at Mill Village Condos is just north of this parcel. Um, the, this property, um, there, it's zoned ag in unincorporated Boulder County, um, but in our Envision Longmont plan, uh, it's designated as parks, greenway, and open space. And the applicant uh, property owner proposes zoning the property agricultural. So that would be consistent with uh, the Envision Longmont plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and so this is the applicant's concept plan. As you can see on it, uh, they have no development proposed, which is consistent with the ag zone. Uh, what they want to do though, is uh, as you can see in, on northwest of this parcel, 
Uh, they have a 112 unit um, paired home development for sale uh, project with affordable housing on it. And they would like to put their detention pond on this parcel and add a sanitary sewer line uh, to serve this property. However, uh, because the property wasn't in the city of Longmont jurisdiction, it had to be annexed first. So uh, that's why we're working through this uh, thank you, uh, working through this process. So there won't be development per se. Uh, the, the property owner would just put in a detention pond, uh, add the sanitary sewer line, and then would leave it undeveloped, uh, which is consistent. Uh, allowable uses in the ag zone include, uh, could be open space, parks, greenways, farms, or golf courses. Uh, and one other thing of note is there's a ditch easement on the north side. Uh, you can see the black line running uh, east to west there. That's the ditch easement uh, that would be maintained. Um, at the first reading of the ordinance a couple weeks ago, uh, council asked um, if there was a way to um, leave this agriculturally zoned in perpetuity, if you will, uh, to prevent it from being rezoned in the future. And um, I gave you a, an amended staff report in there uh, in your packet. Uh, we conferred as staff and determined that a conservation easement uh, was the best route for this uh, because again, it would require an active council to undo this. Um, and so if you look through the annexation agreement in your packet, you'll see we, we updated that. And there's a clause in there that says uh, the property owner shall you know, engage in a annexation, uh, excuse me, a conservation easement for this property uh, once those improvements are installed. And so that uh, concludes uh, my, again, my nuts and bolts report on this. Um, I am available for questions. The applicant's representative, uh, Karen Henry, uh, will be doing a short PowerPoint as well. And then if you still have questions for either myself or Karen, uh, we're both happy to answer. Thank you. So Susan, if you want to queue up Karen's. Councilman, Council, all the one second, Councilman Martin. Um, yes, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be in front of that presentation or not. Um, but my question was, was the conservation easement, since it wasn't in the first reading, is that gonna come back as a, a second ordinance or how does that, do, how does that work? Uh, Council member Martin, uh, it's our understanding, um, the attorney's office wasn't able to get that easement prepared in short order for your packet. So it will come afterward. I, uh, because it's part of the annexation agreement, which is part of the ordinance that you would be approving tonight, um, we can't uh, finalize anything until the conservation easement is executed. It would not come back to you, but it is a requirement of the annexation. Okay, thank you. All righty. All right, let's move on to the next part. So the applicant, Karen Henry, is here uh, to do a short PowerPoint, and Susan will cue that up for us. Hi, for the record, my name's Karen Henry with Henry Design Group. Her address is 1501 Wazi Street, Suite 1C. I'd like to thank Ava. She did a great job in summarizing um, the annexation proposal before you this evening. I just have a couple graphics I'm going to run through real quickly. This is uh, a bigger picture of how the Sugar Mill Paired Homes is, sits in relationship to this annexation parcel. Um, as she said, it's down in the southeast corner, and then the Paired Homes are right at the confluence of uh, Great Western Drive and Third Avenue. Next, please. Next slide. Maybe. <laughs> this is just the annexation map that shows in the hatched area that the contiguity as required um, it has, is being met with no problem. Um, next slide, please. This is just another view of the annexation concept plan. You can see the detention pond outlined in blue and the sanitary sewer line in the pink and purple. It puts it in a better, more visible um, aerial to show the relationship to the condos to the north and the sugar mill paired homes to the northwest. 
Um, as a lot of the questions that came out of our meetings with the condos to the north was access across this parcel to tie into the trailway along the southern edge. And given that this is going into a conservation easement and there will be a road over top of the um, access road for the sanitary sewer, the trail connection can be made. Next slide, please. And this is just an overall of how the sugar mill parcel prepared homes um, sits in relationship to the annexation parcel. And as Ava mentioned, based on the concerns raised at the April 14th first reading, the owner of the property is committed to place this parcel into a conservation easement, which will in perpetuity, um, unless it's just, as she stated, goes back before you guys um, we'll stay as open space. With that, I thank you, and we're happy f to answer any questions. I called on you, Polly. I was just muted. Councilmember Christensen. Thank you. Um, Ms. Henry, I just wanted to thank you and the, um, the um, developer for, for being willing to um, do a conservation easement. I think that'll clarify things and, and um, um, clarify everybody's commitment to keeping this a little open so that the people in Mill Village are not completely surrounded by uh, development. Um, anyway, thank you. I think it'll be good for everybody. Thank you. Do you want to make, Polly? Do you want to make a motion? Oh, I'm. I would move. Uh, Resolution twenty twenty thirty six. No. Oh, okay. Twenty twenty thirty six. Yes. Second. Second. All right. That's been. That was moved by Councilmember Christensen and seconded by Councilmember Peck. Hold on one second. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, anybody uh, have any other comments on that before we vote? All right, all in favor of resolution 2020-36, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. All right, it passes unanimously. Ordinance 2020 a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the sugar mill annexation. Um, if uh, uh, you probably want to make that motion too. Sure. Um, I move passage of 2020. All right, I'll second, second. that. Or actually, Mayor Pro Tem seconded that. Um, anybody have any further questions, comments, dialogue, debate, etc.? All right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 We do aye. the public hearing. Oh, we did. You're, you're, no, we didn't, Eugene. So let's. Is there anybody in the Thank queue? No, I don't see anybody. All right, so we'll not. go. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing. So there's been a motion made. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. All right, let's go ahead to D, adopt changes to citizen participation plan for HUD funded programs to adopt waivers allowed under the CARES Act when considering actions pertaining to COVID-19 programming and funding and hold public hearing. Um, Harold, do we have a presentation on this? Yes, um, Kathy. And then we would also ask all the callers again to call in now if you haven't. Susan, did we lose Kathy? No, oh, there's I Kathy. All right. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Kathy Feather Housing and um, Community Investment Division Manager. And tonight um, I am bringing forward uh, a change to our citizen participation plan for the CDBG and other HUD programs. Um, this is um, coming before you because um, of the COVID um, CDBG CV funding that we will be getting as well as our desire to repurpose some of our regular CDBG um, 2020 funding to address COVID related um, activities and projects. Um, and as part of the CARES Act, you wanna to go to the next slide, please. Um, so as part of the CARES Act, um, 
Congress and HUD provided um, a waiver to, not a waiver, but allowed for some reductions in the regular public notice timeframes um, and the public comment periods um, as that are required as part of the citizen participation plan. So every community getting CDBG funds has to have a citizen participation plan. The re regulations require a minimum uh, public notice and a minimum public comment period when we are either amending our action plans or getting um, um, doing our consolidated plan um, and during our citizen participation plan updates. So if you go to the next slide, um, what the CARES Act allows is that we can go from a uh, required minimum 30-day notice period um, to a five-day notice period. Um, and for a su substantial amendment, go from a 15-day uh, notice period to a five-day notice period. And then on the public comment um, period requirements, um, we can go from 30 days for each of those to five days for each of those. This is a change that's allowed just for the 2020 program year. So it only be in effect for this year um, when we're changing things around um, COVID activities. Um, so what we are proposing is that we go ahead and adopt and change for 20, the year 2020 to allow us to have a, um, a quicker um, comment period and public notice period that allows us to um, reallocate our funds um, more quickly. So, um, what do you, uh -huh. I was just gonna say, what do you need from us? Um, well, we have to have, because we're changing the citizen participation plan, we have to have a public hearing. We've already given the public notice um, timeframe. Um, and then we, um, and then just approval of the proposed changes, if you are so inclined. The other thing, if you can go to the next slide, um, the next other thing we are also suggesting we change as part of the citizen participation plan just for um, this year is to allow staff to bring COVID related funding recommendations to council directly while keeping the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board informed as opposed to going through the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board with applications, with suggestions, having them make recommendations and then coming to council. So that again would, would quicken the, the way to go. Um, and we did run this all by the um, Housing and Human Services Advisory Board, and, and they are in support of the changes to the, to the plan. So basically, you just need a motion approving the changes to the citizen participa participation plan? Right, after holding a public hearing. All right, so let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Is there anybody in the queue? Susan? No, Mayor, not at this time. All right, so let's go ahead and give them about 60 seconds to get in the queue if there's anybody. I don't think there will be, but. Not usually. <laughs> Uh, Councilmember Dago Faring. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so the numbers that you gave to shorten the time from the thirty to the five, um, where did those numbers come from? Were those recommendations? That's what's uh, um, the what's allowed under the CARES Act changes. Okay, that we're allowed to make. Yeah, and then um, and then I guess you know I was reading as through the um, you know there is no really set. Um, like a, a formula for um, coming up with a plan that would really, um, that is foolproof, I guess. And I, I read it on here, I'm trying to find it again. Um, but is there a way that we can kind of reevaluate too if we're finding that, um, that how we are engaging the public during this time isn't, um, isn't really, um, you know, providing ample opportunity for those involved to, to Participate, do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. So um, what I would say is that yes, if, if we're finding that this is too short of a time period uh -huh. where there isn't adequate opportunities, we can always do more. You just okay. can't do less than what the plan mm -hmm. allows. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering like, what are we doing to kind of reevaluate things um, as, as uh, we progress along? 
Right. And if, if I can add to that too, I think one of the things that um, we're doing as well as Boulder County is actually um, actively engaging our cultural brokers in, in conversation in order to, to make sure that we're trying to involve as you know, the breadth of the community when we're moving through these conversations. Yeah. And so, for example, they're on our, the same calls I talked about earlier when we talked about this, they're part of that conversation. Very good. Yeah, because I, you know, one thing that the online learning has taught me is, you know, we make these assumptions that, oh, well, you know, if kids have iPads, they can get online. Well, a lot of them, I mean, I only had three that had line, on, were online. So it was connecting people who most need these resources to be able to, to get them to participate, to have these services, you know, just so that's, that's kind of what I was trying to get at. No, that's a great point. And that's part of when we try to communicate is also getting information out via those cultural brokers so they can plug into their respective communities awesome. to make sure that we're we're, cut, we're, we're handling all of those issues where people can't necessarily get it online and, and we're trying to evaluate to make sure we, how do people call in and do you know every approach imaginable when we talk about that kind of communication. Okay, thanks. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, uh, I think all this has been well done and well prepared. So Kathy, thank you for that and to get us positioned to uh, take advantage of uh, funding and, and uh, resources provided through the CARES Act. I do have, I have a, one question, but it shows up two places. It's not about the substance of criteria or anything else. It is about how we notify people. And on, in the materials that we got, uh, the packet, this was item 8C. So in, in the original packet on page 65, at the end of, page 65, there's a reference to notification of all the above hearings will be published in the Longmont Daily Times call. Uh, then on page 82, there's a reference to published in a daily newspaper. And um, I guess for me, Kathy, the question is, are, are these guys, is this new, is this, are the changes you're proposing short term in terms of just to get through the COVID virus or is this process going to stand beyond the COVID virus, because if it does, we know we're gonna have a new online news source in town, uh, part of the Compass Project in um, probably 30 days. Uh, and we don't know that we're always gonna have a daily newspaper. So the reference on page 82 of a daily newspaper seems to me that we're gonna potentially have to come back and amend this if we don't have a daily newspaper. And, um, and to limit this to the Times Call, I think uh, that does not make sense to me. So. If the language in those two sections were to say local news sources, um, uh, publicly accessible local news sources or something like that, I don't want to wordsmith it, but the, the wording the way it is has nothing to do with the substance of the plan, but it is, I think, important in terms of, of uh, how we notify people. And I understand, Harold, you said we're going to notify every place possible. We're going to post in offices and on websites and whatnot, but specifically, um, to, to make reference to a daily newspaper, which may or may not be around forever, and, uh, and to limit to the Times call, Times call at the exclusion of other news sources does not make sense to me. Yeah, so Council Member um, Waters and, and Mayor, um, that, that's a good point. I actually, I, I think the, um, it originally said Times Call, and then we might have gone to daily newspaper because when we joined the consortium, we were often using also the, the Boulder paper for consortium notices in the city of Boulder. So I think we broadened it out to that. I think in this version, one of the, the red line changes I think I made was to add the city's website um, as, a, as a place as well. Um, so yes, continuing to evolve how we're getting the word out and what is um, official or um, unofficial posting places, but to broaden that as much as possible makes a lot of sense. So I think what we'll need to do once this is over and we'll probably have to amend after year 2020 to remove some of these references, even though I tried to be very clear this was only in place for the year 2020, um, to also look at what else needs to be amended in a, in a, to broaden out that um, public notification. 
So, and I will, and I will add to that too. Um, and Eugene may have to jump in. What we don't know is a lot of times in some of the state and federal guidelines, and I don't know if it imply if it if it is in this specific case, they require us to post on the daily newspaper, and this is a going to be an ongoing challenge with us and some of these. Um, requirements that we have in different funding sources because so the municipalities for, without daily newspapers with their news deserts how do they comply with are they simply dead in the water they don't get to they don't get to use cbdg funds yeah, they probably go to their county closest, newspaper mm, or the closest one to them it just seems to me to, to yeah. make reference to daily know, it is, to, to, uh, publicly accessible <laughs> daily news sources takes you know eliminates any confusion or constraints or problems that you might encounter uh yeah. so i um you know i don't want to i don't want to obstruct putting a uh, long in a position to take advantage of the funding i i, I don't think the language makes sense and just specifically that language All right, that said, do we have a motion uh, to adopt the changes to the citizen participation plan? Did we close the public hearing? Oh, sorry. Do we have anybody in the queue? <laughs> I don't think no. we do. I don't see anybody. No, Mayor, we don't. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Now, do we have a motion? Councilmember Martin, you're touching your computer screen. Why don't you make one? <laughs> so moved. I move we adopt All right. the new rules. I'll second it. Seeing no further debate, questions, comments, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion nay. passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, Kathy. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to general business. I don't think there is any. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to final call public invited to be heard. Is there anybody in the queue? All right, let's go ahead and move on to mayor and council comments. Anybody? Councilmember Christensen? Um, I just want to say thank you for all the people out there who are holding on. I know this is um, an uncomfortable time and a difficult time for everybody, but we've still got to find a way to laugh. We've still got to find a way to appreciate the spring days and keep things from piling up in our lives because you know that they will pile up if you don't take care of them now. So don't get into bad habits that you're just going to have to break. Um, Keep on making masks, keep on wearing masks, keep on keeping on and um, we'll get through this. You know, people are being extremely creative. I tried to get us a goat to participate in our Zoom meeting, but you know, that's 60 bucks and I don't really have that. So <laughs> anyway, take care and everybody stay healthy and stay six feet apart. Pa Polly, I'm sorry, you said a goat? Yes. It's this is, a, you know, farmers are very innovative and they're losing money. Oh, you're, you're literally you're going to get a goat. You were going to bring a goat to our meeting? That's to awesome. To be one of the faces on a little Zoom thing. The goat doesn't really say much except the ah. usual, eh, you know, but okay. it's there. Very cool. That would be cool. Well, All right. It's the Council money for a farmer. <laughs> Councilmember Martin. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I just want to congratulate Hidden Treasure 2. Uh, on distributing their 10,000th mask this week um, and all of the volunteers, since I guess we don't know of all the mask makers who made the 10,000th mask, um, but somebody did and, and it was given out for free. And I want to say I, I drove all the way up there um, today uh, to get two masks that I ordered after I found out how much it's dealing with it, it takes to um, keep them laundered, even though I seem to hardly go out. Um, but uh, uh, I got two masks from them, made a donation. I want everyone to know that. I'm not taking advantage of free masks, but, um, uh, and my masks were great. They have strings that tie in the back. It's so much more comfortable than that ear thing. So I don't know if all the masks are like that, but I'm very happy with mine. So congratulations and thank you, Hidden Treasure, too. All right, anybody else? Uh, Councilmember Hidalgo Ferry? Unmute myself. Okay, um, so first of all, I wanna thank everyone who is um, practicing social distancing, um, 
being careful, you know, staying at home whenever possible and only coming out when absolutely necessary. Uh, I was out today um, collect, getting some food for some, some families and um, I saw that what Walmart was doing and, you know, I commend them for trying to, you know, manage the space, keeping the flow, you know, the one way down the aisles. Um, I know I was going the opposite of what until someone caught me and pointed the arrows out to me. And, um, and you know, it, it, it's a tough, you know, a lot of these guys, these employees, they're, they're, they're young, they're younger than my kids. And it, it's hard for them to have to come up and say, hey, you know, you're doing this, you know, you have to do it this way. And, and then being yelled at by, by people. Um, I, as I was exiting, I did see a man who wasn't wearing a mask and the person who was standing there, you know, it was, this is my, this is our policy. This is what we have to do. You have to have a, have a mask and he's yelling at her. And, you know, and I know this is stressful times, but we have to be patient with each other. We be respectful of one another. You know, when you're not wearing a mask, it's not for your protection. It's, you are preventing other people from getting sick. Even if you don't think that you're sick right now, or, you know, you can be, you can carry something without showing any signs of it. So, you know, be cognizant of that, be respectful, you know, do your part as a, as a Longmont resident, as a, as a good citizen, being responsible. And, you know, and we're all, we're all going through some really tough, stressful times right now. And it's just, you know, please exercise patience. Um, and the other thing too, that I wanted to mention is, as I said earlier, do, moving to online learning as a teacher, what I have discovered is the number of inequities that truly exist, not just in Longmont, but nationwide in our society as a whole. And I think if any good comes out of this, situation is that we will be able to really pinpoint where are the where are these inequities are where's the fault what's happening in our society that we can fix and rectify and so when we go back to normal i don't want us to go back to normal i want us to to work to make real change so that's that's all i have to say all right anybody else all right we'll go ahead and wrap up uh mayor and council comments city manager harold you got anything No comments other than as we learn more, we're going to be sending that your direction as we figure everything out. All right, cool. Eugene, anything from you? No comments, Mayor. All right, great. I hope when we get back to live meetings, we can always get done at 9.15. This is awesome. <laughs> so anyway, enjoy your week. We're, uh, we're adjourned. Actually, Joan, would you like to make a motion, please? Are you always going to call on me, Mayor Bagby? Yep, I am. <laughs> Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Joan, do you have something else to say? Oh, I just said have a good week. Okay, you too, guys. We're adjourned. Thanks. <laughs>